G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle. In the previous mainline episode in this series, we discussed how a Legion performs a drop assault, how quickly troops can be delivered to the ground, their breakout tactics, etc. This was in an ideal situation against an unprepared enemy, but what happens when the Legions get dragged into a grueling siege or some form of attritional conflict? Legions are large and have incredible firepower, but a Legion isn't designed for siege breaking on its own. It's designed to work in unison with forces like the Auto Reductor or the Imperial Army. Let's look at how the Legions and their, specifically Imperial Army, allies break sieges open and what happens in today's episode. So first of all, let's understand the key instrument of battle here, and that is the artillery. As artillery creates the weaknesses that the Legions can exploit, we need to look at their key types and their uses. So firstly we have the field gun. Now field guns are used in direct fire rolls. Field guns are used to kill enemy armour which advances forward as well as uh, any small fortifications, anything that's in direct line of sight observable from the gun's position or near enough to. It's firing at very low, very flat trajectories. Now the basilisk, the basilisk is a type of howitzer and it's the most important weapon because the basilisk is able to fire shells over very long ranges. It's designed to disrupt the enemy in the rear and perform the counter battery work and it does this by firing shells in very high trajectories. The medusa. It's similar to the basilisk but with a much shorter range and a heavier shell and it's used to lob large shells shorter distances into enemy positions. It trades off the range for the more powerful explosive payload. The Medusa is ideal for directly targeting the enemy forward positions. It's a bunker buster. Then we have the Morbus Bombard. This incredibly powerful howitzer is used in much the same manner as the Medusa, but is able to take out hardened bunkers beneath the enemy position by firing the super heavy shell high into the air before it comes crashing down and buries in the ground prior to exploding. Then we have Mortars. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's a regular mortar, quad mortar, even a tracked carriage uh, of some other kind, such as the griffin mortar. This weapon is used to provide direct infantry support by indirectly firing in an enemy position. Mortars are generally highly mobile compared to full-sized artillery, and this allows them to both keep up with the enemy advance and provide direct supporting firepower at the expense of range. The Legion Basilisk and Medusa. Now, they occupy a similar role to the regular Basilisk and Medusa, with two key differences. Firstly, they provide the registered artillery support to the advancing legion, moving at their beck and call. And secondly, once ground is seized, they are best placed to provide support against counterattack whilst the Imperial Army artillery units move forward. The Whirlwind. It's used to provide saturation bombardment over a large area, quickly firing dozens of accurate missiles towards a target before quickly relocating so the enemy response uh, is targeted where the whirlwind was, not where it now is. And the Vindicator. The Vindicator is unique in this list in that it's an assault gun. You could also technically put the Thunderer into this list and super heavy tanks of various kinds. These weapons are direct fire and they're designed to advance forward and eliminate enemy fortifications which would otherwise hold up infantry, such as in placed heavy machine gun teams, light enemy artillery, anti-tank guns, heavy bunkers, etc. So, how do these units get used in a breakout assault? Firstly, the Imperial Army artillery is broken up by job roll with short-range artillery such as field guns and medusas assigned to direct bombardment of forward enemies. The basilisks are divided into three categories, sometimes with medusas mixed in. The first is plunging fire into the forward defences. The second is disruption of further enemy assets and counter-battery. And counter-battery is further broken up into two categories, being direct counter battery and reserve counter battery. Disruption bombardment is used to prevent the enemy sending units forward to assist the front lines during an attack, and over days can lead to supply issues and chronic manpower crises. That is to say that if the front trench 
is separated from the second line of trenches by consistent and non-stop bombardments, then it's impossible to bring forward things like water, food, and ammunition supplies to that front trench without losing them to that artillery fire. Counter-battery is the task of destroying enemy artillery, and is broken up based on the fact that you never spot all of the guns. They can be hidden in ambush, moved around overnight, etc. Therefore, a series of guns are placed on call, waiting for the enemy to respond to any attack, and then once they do so, they can quickly target and eliminate those guns foolish enough to return fire from their previously hidden locations. For the legions, their main direct control is over their own assets, as coordinating with the Imperial Army is a nightmare during an offensive, when the superhuman speed, sensors and battle coming of the Astartes is really at the forefront. The legions utilise a combination of siege breakers and masters of signals in these roles, to report where fire is required and how best to apply it. Some legions, such as the Iron Warriors, more directly integrate Imperial Army and order reductor forces into their own, maintaining direct oversight over their heavy units and tasking them as they would any legion unit or asset. Now, let's look at an example of how each task is actually performed. The opening stages of an assault is carried out by the Basilisks and Medusas of the Imperial Army in unison. They will bombard a section of the forward enemy defensive line. The bombardment is designed to suppress enemy forces and prevent them from firing upon the marines who are staging for the assault. This, for the sake of simplicity, will be called Group 1. The long-range mortars and Morbus bombards, along with the bulk of the Basilisks, meanwhile, are commencing a withering bombardment of the enemy emplaced artillery batteries. It's important to note that the enemy could be employing weaponry as simple as black powder artillery through to the web spinners the Eldar or high-tech plasma emplacements. The type of artillery doesn't matter, only that the full weight of almost half of all artillery assets will be devoted to the role of suppressing them in order to completely stop any enemy response to an assault. This will be called Group 2. A smaller quantity of these same units will be placed in position, but will hold fire, reserving their shells in the off chance that an undiscovered enemy asset opens fire. This allows Group 2 to focus on their original task and not having to divert fire from that job. This third group, therefore, well, we'll call it Group 3, and they have to be the most alert and most attentive. Lastly, a small amount of artillery is tasked with extremely long-ranged fire. These units are actively employed in the role of disrupting enemy communications and logistics in the rear echelons, preventing reserve groups from moving forward, etc. They'll target roads, cross sections, T junctions, train stations, whatever it might be, to slow down enemy logistics, and this is known as Group 4. Then we have the Astartes part of the assault. So the Astartes, their armoured spearhead is generally led by squadrons of three land raiders with an attached Vindicator siege gun. This armoured force will surge forward and Astartes will be disgorged from the land raiders directly into the enemy forward defensive lines. The Vindicators in this force occupy themselves with providing direct fire support for the infantry against hardened emplacements, crushing bunkers, knocking down walls, things like that. This group shall be called Group A. So keep track with me. We've got four groups of Imperial Army Artillery. One, two, three, four. And we've got Group A now of the Astartes. It's important to note that in Titanic scale assaults, such as Isfahan 5, this group could actually be formed of even larger assets, such as Spartan tanks and Typhons, scaled up to suit the threat level. A second force of Astartes, composed principally of Predator battle tanks and Sycharum battle tanks, will now move forward. Their job is in aiming to exploit any potential gap in the enemy lines, as well as adding a surge of firepower. These will be backed up with several rhinos loaded with fresh troops, aiming to fan out once the enemy line is shattered. This will be called Group B. Group C is the supporting element in the assault and this will be composed of whirlwinds, rapier batteries, and legion artillery assets, namely the Basilisk and Medusa. These units are in direct communication with the other Astartes elements, and their role is to provide fire support as called in by the Astartes. So if an enemy armoured force suddenly appears or a counterattack forms, the Group C elements will start opening fire on that incoming enemy. The Imperial Army is not asked to do so. 
The Astartes fight in this way as communicating with the Imperial Army and coordinating their fire is too time consuming a task when compared with the unbridled efficiency, coordination and the data link of the Astartes. These units are also far more mobile than their Imperial Army counterparts, able to rapidly move up and keep pace with the other Astartes units. Even resupply is made easier as drop pods full of stores can actually come down and land next to Legion artillery vehicles and the superhuman crew can quickly jump out and manhandle the ammunition quickly and tirelessly in their vehicles, whilst the basic humans of the Imperial Army would actually require work gangs and complicated lifting equipment to perform the same task, greatly slowing down their pace. This is the first stage in a breakout assault. The next stage is the actual commencement of the assault. So with the Astartes surging forward, the Imperial Army will now begin the slow process of packing up their sections and moving forward. Group 1 artillery will shift fire from the first to the second enemy defensive lines as soon as Group 8 assault launches into the enemy positions. At this point, the Medusa, field gun and mortar batteries are no longer in range and their crews will quickly take stock, assess their ammunition levels and begin to move forward. Imperial Army soldiers will also begin to occupy all the previously occupied positions of the Astartes and also surge into the enemy positions so that the Astartes can continue to move forward to exploit the enemy withdrawal. Group B Astartes will coordinate with their land speeder and jet bike units to confirm if the enemy batteries in the direct vicinity are still functional. This recon information is also passed on to the Imperial Army who will break down Group 2 and begin the laborious task of moving their units forward and restocking their ammunition, removing guns for overhaul which have eroded, etc. Group 3 will maintain their positions, keeping a lookout for any enemy forces that pop up requiring counter-battery work. Group C Astartes will meanwhile be maintaining close proximity to Group B's forces. Group A's Astartes will remount their vehicles and act as a ready reserve force for Group B, which will be taking the lead until such time as heavy resistance is encountered. Once Groups 1 and 2 have moved their assets forward, Group A's long-range guns will take over the harassment role from Group 4, freeing them to move up, whilst Group 2 will temporarily take over Group 3's rapid response counter-battery role. Group 3 will cycle their units through this in order to allow an appropriate period to rest the crews and to clean and continue the ongoing restocking of guns and ammunition. And once all units have moved up, and if the Astartes meet sufficient resistance that they feel it wasteful to charge headlong, they'll simply fall back to the Imperial Army positions and stage a repeat of the previous assault operation. This concludes the stage 2 in the breakout assault. Now the defensive position. After successfully completing an assault, the enemy is often keen to counterattack the Imperium's forces, and when a counterattack is spotted, the response may seem surprising. Firstly, the Astartes will pull their units back, turning from an assault force into a ready reserve counterattack force. The Astartes' greatest fear is they will commit to an assault too early, and it will merely be a feint which pins them in place when the real strike can occur on elsewhere in the Imperial lines. Therefore, it falls upon the Imperial Army to weather the enemy assault. The groups described previously only changed their roles slightly, with Group 2 and 3 now combining in the counter-battery role, whilst Group 4 performs harassing fire and Group 1 pummels enemy assaults as they stream forward, alongside the infantry and armoured assets assisting firepower. Astartes Group C will not assist at this time, so as to not give away their position. Once the enemy has fully committed to their assault, the Astartes observers will select an area to counterattack, usually a thin and vulnerable sector. At this point, Group B will surge and attempt to encircle and cut off enemy units, trapping them between Astartes units and the Imperial Army's guns. Group A will try to strike directly at the enemy command centres, and Group C will once again act as a ready support element to the Astartes assault. This tactic was very famously employed by the Iron Hands during the Great Crusade, during the Battle of Rust on a planet 02-34 in the year 807 of Millennia 30. The Iron Hands requested that the Imperial Army conduct a planet strike away from the strongholds and fortify a defensive position in the desert. The Iron Hands then ended up using the Urshad regiments of the Imperial Army to soak up wave after wave of orc assaults, 
until the majority of the orcs had committed to the battle, allowing the Astartes to land with a large mechanised ABC force, which would then go on to encircle and cut down the Greenskins mercilessly. With their forces wasted in battle, the Iron Hands Imperial Army were then able to move into the enemy strongholds, which were now mostly devoid of defenders, and the campaign was wrapped up quickly after. The strike and counter-strike format was called the Hammer and Storm Tactic. So, conclusion. This is a simplistic take on a very complex tactical scenario, and there are many additional elements not counted for, such as aircraft, orbital bombardment, orbital flanking assault, etc. But this is designed to give you a rough overview of how these sort of operations are performed and just how crucial the Imperial Army could be. At the end of the day, there are only a couple of million Space Marines available to the Imperium right up until the end of the Great Crusade. Most of the Great Crusade, therefore, is being carried on the shoulders of the Imperial Army. And because of this fact, the Imperial Army is just so important in allowing these events to take place the way that they do. If you don't have regular human firepower added to an Astartes assault, you just end up wasting Astartes in headstrong attacks directly into enemy fortifications. Instead, the Imperium wanted to play it smarter than that. And although attrition did have its place, most legions were smart enough to know when it was not a good idea. Anyway, that's it for me. I'm Mac with the Outer Circle. Thank you all for watching this episode. I hope you got something out of it. And I'll catch you on the next one.